Go ahead. Good evening. This is the call, the Tuesday, May 18th, 2021 Board of Trustees of the Wilmot Public Library meeting to order at 6.02 p.m. All the notices have been given and Director Austin is broadcasting virtually from the library per the orders by uh, the government. So at this point in time, Trustee Arshis, can you do the roll call? I certainly will. Um, Trustee Barshis here. Trustee Fishman. Here. Trustee Neelan. Oh, not yet. You. Oh, not yet. Okay. No, not yet. They have to be sworn in. Okay. Thank so you. we've got. It. All right. I'm sorry. Um, so we have Trustee Wolf. This is a little out of order. Um, and uh, um, let's see. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought oh, I had every, okay. everything in order. I need some help. <laughs> okay. Sure, I can step in if you'd step like. In. You want okay. me to do it? Okay. Okay, so let's start at the top. Trustee Barshis. Here. Trustee Fishman. Here. Trustee Johnson. Here. Trustee Riddle. Here. Uh, Trustee Rogers. Here. Trustee Wolf. Here. And Trustee McDonald. Present. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And so at this time, we have uh, at the back of your agenda, you have the certification of the official result results of the election. Trustees that were elected for the, the next four year for the next term are Marianne O'Keefe, Tracy Summer, and Patricia Nealon at this time and congratulations and at this time we're going to administer the oath of office and uh prior to this the uh trustees elect went and signed and got notarized at the public library so that we could have their signature so it's a it's semi-official and so trustee barshis would you like to now do swear them in Okay. Patricia Nealon. Um, do I read it? They follow? Yeah, or? you read it okay. one at a time. I, Patricia Nealon. I, Patricia Nealon. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. Or affirm. Or affirm. Or affirm, yeah. That I will support the Constitution of the United States that I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties. And I will faithfully discharge the duties. Of the Office of Library Trustee. Of the Office of Library Trustee. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. Okay. I, Marianne O'Keefe. I, Marianne O'Keefe. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. Or affirm. Or affirm. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office. Of library trustee. Of library trustee. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. Okay. I, Tracy Summer. I, Tracy Summer. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear or affirm or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States, that I will support the Constitution of the United States and 
the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties. Of the Office of Library Trustee. Of the Office of Library Trustee. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. Okay. Congratulations to our new trustee. Yes. And I would like to thank my old standbys, Stuart, Ron, and Dan for all your service. And it, later on, when we get to the action items, there will be some resolutions that were drafted, which you've already seen. And hopefully when things will open up, we might have an open house celebration just to say goodbye when we can actually see each other in person at the library. So thank you. Okay. So very welcome. Okay. You're welcome. Any any statements that you all would like to make at this time? They you did they gave you gave them the resolutions, right? No, 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 no. I'm just asking them at any set. Those oh, are action oh, items. Okay. Okay. Maybe I'll go first since I'm the most yeah. junior, but okay. Uh, it was a very kind resolution. Uh, thank you for writing it. Uh, I did want to note, I did, in light of current events, uh, I found it a little moving to see citizens swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Uh, and I think it's, I, people kind of criticize how many governments we have in Illinois, but I got to say there's something very sort of civic and moving about citizens uh, serving as volunteers and uh, swearing to defend the constitution and the rule of law. So um, uh, I, I wanted to note that, but I uh, uh, would close with saying I really um, appreciated the opportunity to engage uh, in our shared governance and enjoyed our discussions and uh, wish the ladies all the best going forward. So thank you uh, for the opportunity. And I, the citizens thank you most of all, and we thank. Uh, okay, anybody else? I, and, I, I, and I'll defer to Ron to go last, since he is uh, he is uh, he's a, he's a librarian himself in terms of uh, being a trustee. So I I will just say that again, I um, uh, experience for me, uh, I had no idea what I was working on exactly when I joined the board, except that I knew that the library is and continues to. Be I just have felt uh, very privileged and honored that I could help kind of nurture and support this institution uh, and the people who work here and the community that gets to partake of, of this wonderful place and, and to continue to make it grow and become uh, even better than it was when I, when I first joined. And, and so it's been such a pleasure to work with everybody on the board and with our newest director, Anthony, and the third that I've had the privilege of working with. And, and again, um, Again, there have been so many highlights for me in terms of being a board member. And so I thank everybody that made that possible and everybody that I've had the, the, the good fortune to work with both on the board and at the library. And also, of course, as mentioned in the resolution, Professor Plum. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think the, um, the most fitting tribute to uh, service on this board is the fact that the library continues to be well served to well serve and be highly regarded by the residents of Wilmette. The fact that during the pandemic, our circulation rate was 96% of that before the pandemic uh, is a tribute to the staff and to um, uh, the community of Wilmette as library users. And any role that I've had in helping to facilitate that um, uh, has been uh, a part of my commitment to help sustain and maintain the quality of services that Wilmette residents want. I will remain available to assist in any way that I can as a private citizen, um, but I, I thank the community for the opportunity to serve. Thank you. So can we all give a round of applause for their service? And sure. you can unmute. And thank you so very much. Boom. Okay, Jan, now you can do this roll call. <laughs> okay.
Okay. <laughs> Barishas, it's here. Fishman. Trustee here. Fish Trustee Nealon. Here. Trustee O'Keefe. Here. Trustee Riddle. Here. Trustee Summer. Here. And Trustee McDonald. Here. Okay. At this time, uh, we get a report from the nominating committee, the slate. Trustee Barshis was chair and trustees Fishman and O'Keefe were also on the committee and we do like to read the slate. Sure, the nominating committee report. The nominating committee consisting of Jan Barshis chair, Joan Fishman and Mary Ann O'Keefe met individually during May to discuss and, and reach agreement on the nominees for the different board offices. The committee presents the following nominees also who have agreed to serve for our board offices. Lisa McDonald, President, Joan Fishman, Vice President, Jan Barsha's Secretary, and Tracy Summer, Treasurer. Thank you for the report. At this time, do we need to adopt? We don't need to adopt that report, I don't think. But at this time, you've heard the slate. And what we want to do is open it up for nominations from the floor. And so we'll start with each position and I'm going to read it real quick. I'll say it three times, but you have the option that if you would like to uh, put somebody else forward to do so at this time. For the office of WPL Pre board president, any nominations from the floor? Any nominations from the floor? Any nominations from the floor? Okay, at this time. For the office of the Wilmette Public Library Board Vice President, are there any nominations from the floor? Any nominations from the floor? Any nominations from the floor? For the position of Board Treasurer, are there any nominations from the floor? Any nominations from the floor? Any nominations from the floor? For the position of board secretary, are there any nominations from the floor? Any nominations from the floor? Any nominations from the floor? Being that there are no nominations from the floor, I would like to make a motion or to have someone make a motion that we adopt the slate for the elected board of officers since there are no contested positions. I move that we accept the uh, slate of offices. Board is, there, offices. is there a second? I'll, I'll second that. Okay, so Trustee, Trustee Nealon has moved that we accept the slate of offices for the 21 through 23 and Trustee Fishman has seconded the motion. Can we have the roll call? Trustee Sorry. Barshis. Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman. Yes. Trustee Nealon? Yes. Trustee O'Keefe? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Summer? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. Thank you. And I, we, I look forward to serving you. It'll be an interesting two years because we've got the strategic plan coming up and post-COVID, so who knows? A whole new world, but not too new. Okay, at this time we open the floor for public comment. Anybody who wishes to address the board can do so at this time. One thing we didn't note, did you know, Anthony, uh, we called the roll, but we didn't note visitors and staff. Do you want to just... I've been able to document that um, okay. information in my notes here, so I think we're good. Okay, so are, is there anybody that would like to speak? Okay, it's been said twice, so we can move on. But you have the draft of the minutes from our April meeting. Can we have a nomination to adopt that? I still move that. Whoops. <laughs> who's, who's first? Tracy, you go ahead. I'll nominate to approve the minutes. And I'll second that. 
Okay, Trustee Summer has moved to approve the minutes. Trustee Fishman has seconded it. Are there any correct questions or corrections to the minutes? Mm -hmm. Having none, can we have a roll call? Trustee Barges. Okay, Trustee Barges, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Nealon? Yes. Trustee O'Keefe? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Summer? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. Okay, since we're in transition, there are no presentations. So we're gonna move on to the treasurer's report. And since we're in transition, we're gonna have financial manager Risco, Risco go over the treasurer's report. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'll try to do my best uh, uh, run as possible, but uh, uh, during April, we um, a good month, we've taken a lot of the, the first uh, first portion of the property taxes. We took about 187,000 in there. Um, we also took in a, a good amount of personal property taxes, um, which is um, usually a little bit more than expected. I think uh, what happens is this comes in a month in arrears, so, um, people went out shopping in March and they shopped really good. And uh, uh, general fund interest is the other big amount, $7,700 there. Um, expenditures, um, expected 10 month rate at 83.33%. We came in at just under 75%. Um, the checks, uh, we did uh, three check runs in April. So that's why you'll see a large number of uh, large amount of activity in that check deep tail report. Um, two payrolls, uh, nothing out of the ordinary there. Um, certificates of deposit, we continue to, um, to see the numbers of those decrease. Um, as uh, we've mentioned uh, in multiple months is, as those go away, we're coming out of CDs that are at, you know, two to 3% and we're going into a, uh, Usually a max safe account or a similar product for anywhere from uh, 0.1 to 0.2 points to two percent. So um, nothing sh shocking to everyone. It's it's just something we're you know we're dealing with and uh, we're keeping them in a um, in a liquid state so that if something does happen, we'll be prepared to uh, um, take advantage of any rate increases. So um, anything else there? Did I? Did I miss anything, Ron? Is it? Anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. um, I actually, John, I actually, I just, I don't know if I should talk, but I actually talked to Anthony because I had a whole bunch of questions. And just one sure. thing that I know, and this is more for public comment, just so that people kind of are aware. One thing I noticed that the personnel number is significantly down and I talked to Anthony, it's due to staff changes and retirements, but that likely will come significantly under budget this year um, due to those changes in unfilled positions, uh, which will likely cause the budget in a whole to be under budget this year. Does that seem correct to everybody? Okay. Yes, um, when we did the budget at the beginning of the year, we uh, that was prepared before um, we came out of uh, uh, the pandemic and, and we did it accordingly. And then June 30th, uh, end of the fiscal year, we, once we reopened, um, uh, we had a good, I think 15% of our personnel decide not to return it or, and retire. So, um, you know, what happens when a, a lot of people that have been there a long time, those are uh, some large salaries. Um, when they retire, they leave it's, it, like I said, it's, it's, they're replaced by lesser paid individuals. So, um, yeah, it's it's safe to say, but again, it's we do have to hire people, and, and I know that's mm -hmm. Anthony's got that on his on his radar. Right. Yes, I understand. I just wanted to make a kind of note to that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Tracy, any other notes in terms of what stood out for you? Um, I talked to Anthony. I just, <clears throat> I mean, I just asked about some of the checks more to familiar my familiarize myself with some of the more regular ones, such as like the insurance. Um, you know, some of the regular learning electronic. I, I went through a lot of this stuff really just to make myself familiar with it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Is there a motion to oh, adopt? Wait, one more. I'll actually say one more thing. One thing I did note for anybody that was digging into the financials, there does say that the fiscal year budget for the reserve fund is $6 million. That's actually not what we anticipate to spend. That's just the number that's in there. It's not really a budget item that we actually expect to spend. Okay. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the bills and salaries for April 2021? I motion to pay the bills and salaries. Okay. Is there a second? I second that motion. Okay. So Trustee Summers has moved and Trustee Fishman has seconded it. Trustee O'Keefe. Oh, I didn't see that <laughs> looking there. Okay, gotcha. I'll get mm. used to the voices. <laughs> I was looking there, not there. Okay. Okay. Trustee Barshes. Okay. Trustee Barshes, yes. Trustee Fishman. Yes. Trustee Needlin. Yes. Trustee O'Keefe. Yes. Trustee Riddle. Yes. Trustee Summer. Yes. Trustee McDonald. Yes. Okay, and now we're moving to our action items and several of the trustees assisted and Anthony and his staff helped clean it up. And I would like to read the resolutions and we would like to first read resolution number 2020-21-204 and it's honoring trustee Dan Johnson resolution honoring trustee Dan Johnson and it's the Board of Wilmette Library Trustees of the Wilmette Public Library District, Cook County, Illinois. Whereas Dan Johnson was elected to the Wilmette Public Library Board of Trustees in 2017 and whereas Dan served as a trustee from 2017 to 2021 and whereas Dan's interest in the library has been evidenced as chair of the Advocacy and Partners Committee, where he facilitated the addition of a book return box with the CTA at the Linden Station Committee and suggested numerous initiatives. And whereas Dan has regularly offered suggestions regarding finances that have been addressed by the board. And whereas Dan's straightforward thinking has been known and appreciated by his fellow board members. And whereas the board deeply appreciates Dan's service as a board member and as an effective voice supporting the taxpayers' interests and the role of the library in the community. It is therefore resolved that for the reasons enumerated, Dan will be greatly missed and further resolved that the president of the board is authorized to present resolution number 2020-21-204 to Dan Johnson. Should we do it all at the end or one at a time in terms of passing the resolution? Oh, we'll do, we'll do them all at the same time. <laughs> that's a whole lot of name calling. I'd also like to, and that doesn't diminish what we're saying. I'd also like to, uh, read uh, the next action item is resolution number 2021-205 resolution honoring trustee Ronald Rogers the board of the Wilmette the board of library trustees of the Wilmette Public Library District Cook County Illinois resolution number 20-21-205 resolution honoring Dr. Ronald Rogers Whereas Ronald Rogers was appointed to Wilmette Public Library Board of Trustees in October 1984, subsequently elected in April 1985, and has ably served for 37 years. And whereas Ron's leadership capabilities have been evident during his service as board president, board vice president, board secretary, and board treasurer. And whereas Ron's interest in the library has demonstrated been demonstrated in numerous areas, including as serving as chair of every board committee, finance, facilities and equipment, personnel, strategic planning, and three director searches. And whereas Ron's institutional knowledge and professional expertise in journalism 
and creating licensing exams for trade organizations has been invaluable in helping the board maintain safe and comfortable facilities for the staff and patrons. And whereas Ron's thorough and complete understanding of Robert's Rules of Orders, parliamentary procedure, the budget, appropriation, and levy processes, and his willingness to share his knowledge has facilitated the training of fellow trustees. And whereas Ron's recognition as Illinois as the Illinois Library Association's Trustee of the Year in 2020 is a testament to his regional. He served as both board president of the North Suburban Library System, state, he was ILA public on the ILA Public Policy Committee, as well as local leadership, where his guidance throughout the annual financial processes has helped the library develop and maintain adequate capital reserves and avoid the need for referenda. And whereas Ron's dry wit, good humor, and patience has been regularly evidenced and appreciated by his fellow board members. And whereas the board deeply appreciates Ron's devoted efforts and longtime loyal service as a board member and as a passionate and effective voice supporting the essential role of a public library in a democrat, dem democratic society. It is therefore resolved that for the reasons enumerated and for many additional qualities and achievements too numerous to recount, Ron will be exceptionally missed. And further resolve that the president of the board is authorized to present resolution number 20 2020-21-205 to Dr. Rogers. And now for the third resolution. The Board of Library Trustees of the Wilmette Public Library District, Cook County, Illinois. Resolution number 2020-21-206. Resolution honoring Stuart Wolf. Whereas Stuart Wolf was elected to the Wilmette Public Library Board of Trustees in April 2013 and has ably served for eight years. And whereas Stuart's interest in the library has been evidenced in numerous areas, including his active participation in the various board committees, such as the finance and policy committees, as well as serving as vice president. And whereas Stewart has regularly offered thoughtful suggestions regarding a variety of topics that have been addressed by the board, including the selection of a new library director. And whereas Stewart's positive demeanor, creative ideas, collaborative skills, and straightforward thinking and humor have been known and appreciated by his fellow board members. And whereas Stewart and whereas Stewart has provided outreach to both the Wilmette and Kenilworth communities through Professor Plum and serving as a board liaison to the Kenilworth Public Library District Board. And whereas the board deeply appreciates Stewart's loyal service as a board member and as an effective voice supporting the essential role of the public library in the community. It is therefore resolved that for the reasons enumerated and for other qualities too numerous to recount, the board thanks Stuart Wolf for his service and acknowledges that his presence on the board will be greatly missed. And further resolve that the president of the board is authorized to present resolution number 2020-21-206 to Stuart Wolf. So thank you and now I need a motion to approve resolutions 2020-21-204 through resolutions 2020-21-206 honoring trustees Dan Johnson, Ronald Rogers, and Stuart Wolf. I so move that the resolutions 204, 205, and 206 be adopted. Is there a second? 
I'll second, I second that. that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So Trustee Fishman has moved that we adopt resolutions 2020. Let me get this right. 2020 21 slash 204 through 2020 21 slash 206. And Trustee Nealon has seconded the motion. Can we have a roll call? Trustee Barshis? Yes. Trustee Barshis? Yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Nealon? Yes. Trustee O'Keefe? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Summer? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. It's been moved, seconded, and passed unanimously. Thank you. Okay. And I need to get all of you trustees in there to sign it once we fine tune okay. it. So after tomorrow, you can come and see Anthony and sign it. So thank you. Okay. At this time, this is what we, annual, we do annually. And there's ordinance number 2020 slash 21 hyphen 199, setting the schedule for the regular meetings of the board. Traditionally, uh, I just want to do a precept to get a feeling for what time you want to meet once uh, things resume normally in September. Traditionally, we would meet at 730 when COVID struck and we were meeting remotely. It was changed to six o'clock so that because Anthony had to be present at the library and the library closed at six o'clock. The goal is that it should be comfortable or convenient for anybody that would like to attend once the library is opened or once we go back to regular hours to attend. So I'm just curious as what your pleasure. So we're at six now, we were at 7.30 and we could be somewhere in between. So it's open for discussion right now. Your thoughts? I'll jump in first. I think six o'clock has been excellent because it seems as though it's later in the day if people are working or want to uh, get on the call or attend. And then we are done. Sometimes if it takes two hours or more, we're done before the library closes. And I think that's, uh, so far been very, mm -hmm. very good. So I would uh, encourage everyone to consider six o'clock as our start time. I, I, I have one question. Um, has there been any feedback from um, any members of the community, observers or uh, other employees of the library uh, preferring a later time? Well, given that the library uh, was closing at six o'clock mm -hmm. and it was COVID and we went remotely, the only uh, concerns have been through two trustees that had young children, uh, Trustee Riddle and um, Trustee Johnson, you know, had some concerns. But because Anthony has to be there physically based on what's required by uh, to hold a virtual meeting, and that's why we had shifted it to six o'clock. I would, I would, my only thing is I don't have little kids. I would do it just a little bit later because I think that, I mean, Fee and I look at you because you have, you, you and Marianne have younger kids. I would, I would do 6.30 or seven. I can really do any time, but mm -hmm. I would do a little bit later. Not, not 7.30 seems a little late, but um, I'm, I'm totally open to Okay. Six mm -hmm. o'clock works for me. So very open to whatever time everyone needs and wants. Okay. And I, I'll just pipe in for one second to uh, the mm -hmm. point that Trish had made a moment ago um, in terms of feedback. I will say it is probably a consequence of us doing this virtually. Um, we've never had such strong attendance at our board meetings as we've had since we've gone to Zoom in the last year. Um, a, a number of staff are able to attend these meetings. We do see greater participation from the public. Um, I do see that our observer um, from the League of Women Voters um, has piped in in the chat and she says that she prefers seven as an observer. Um, so, but I would say that by and large, we've had really strong uh, participation um, from others in the community at the, at the time that we've had this last year. So just wanted to add that point too. Sorry, Fina, mm -hmm. I think I interrupted you. Fina? 
Dina, did you want to say anything? Yeah, you know, thanks. I you didn't interrupt me. Thank you. I was just gonna say I um I wanted to know about yeah the, I I agree the public having commute times once again, um you know that might affect our public participation. Um, are we planning on continuing the Zoom in conjunction with the public? Uh, sorry, with the board meeting, in person board meeting. Uh, the, the Zoom format will continue as long as the governor allows us to do so. And um, at, at the moment, we're still able to continue doing that. It looks like we're still going to have that as part of the executive order, at least for uh, probably the summer months, it appears. So, um, and then going forward, we do have a modified format for how we can present the meeting. We've got some new technology for how we'll record the meetings. Um, so we'll you know, we'll still be able to, to present recordings as we've done. And uh, we're going to work towards having a, a live stream uh, as many of our um, other government entities are doing right now as well. That was my question. So we'll record it, can, we'll continue to record it, but the live stream I think is what's been, I think what's been maybe the moving factor and getting so much participation. I have young kids, but I do prefer a little bit of a later time. It's, there's carpools and there's dinner. Um, and then I think in the, when commute time happens, once again, my, my husband gets home a little bit later when he's going to start to commute. So seven actually, you know, I think sounds like a good, a good start time. 6.30 or seven would start like a good start time for him. Mm -hmm. I would propose that. Okay. I do remember that from the days of, of younger kids and like Tracy, I don't have uh, young kids at home now, but I, I know it can be really disruptive to have a six o'clock meeting when you have to do dinner and, and, uh, um, you know, pick up kids. So I don't know, I would suggest that maybe we split the difference and do 6.30. Okay. The thought. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sold. Is that okay? Should we do a straw vote? Just to do, because we, we don't have polling capabilities in terms of doing a poll. You can vote on whether you want 6.30. And Lisa, do we decide this meeting or do we want to wait until there's some more feedback? You would like to decide well, this meeting? Well, we pa we're passing the ordinance and the ordinance has uh, and what we could say in the ordinance is that uh, we'll meet till six o'clock until the library opens until we until September and then move it then till 630. Anthony, any thoughts? So, but I thought it was good to get it out because mm -hmm. you're all here. It's not a special meeting and it's open to the public and then if there is any backlash because sometimes if we have to go in the special meeting, it goes, it can be long. And I'm, Very, a six, and I'm a 6 a.m., 5 a.m. person. So I, the earlier, the better is fine with me. So. That's <laughs> so how I feel too, but but I'll split the difference in 6.30 seems okay. very workable. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then the ordinance reads, so the dates are, uh, you've got the dates. And so the ordinance reads, should read, well, first of all, we got to do two things. Oh, okay, I've got paper. Okay, so the ordinance to schedule. We've got two things, and I've got a quick question. We've got the one for holidays, and then we've got the one. Okay. All right, so there's a little bit of background information as a cover sheet. That's just kind of a, a tradition that we do for everyone to keep track of where the holidays are in relation to our board meetings. And the good thing this year is that the holidays do not conflict or coincide with the board meetings. So if you do want to adopt the resolution with the updated, um, or rather the ordinance with the updated um, time, um, then we just need to say as, uh, as amended okay. and note that time. And you don't need to read the, uh, the entire uh, ordinance. <laughs> You're tired of that, aren't you, Ovid? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'd like to move that we pass ordinance Number 2020-21-199, setting schedule for regular meetings of the board and amend the time from 7.30 to 6.30 p.m. Is there a second? I'll second, okay. Trustee Fishman. Okay, Trustee McDonald has moved. Trustee Fishman has seconded it. Is there any other discussion? Okay, Trustee... Barshis, can we have roll call, please? Mm -hmm. Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Needlin? Yes. Trustee O'Keefe? 
Yes. Trustee Riddle. Yes. Trustee Summer. Yes. And Trustee McDonald. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And then this, I'm gonna let Anthony explain it. We do this every year and it's the annual decision to participate in the public library non-resident service program, which essentially means that if they aren't paying taxes and are in an unincorporated area, they would have to pay the equivalent of taxes on their household that the Wilmette residents pay. And it mm -hmm. has rarely, if ever happened, I think at least since I've been here, nobody has ever done it. That's 10 plus years. Do you want to add something, Director Austin? I, I have to say, Lisa just said it all. Um, we did confirm today that we currently have no members of, the, of our community that are participating in this program at this time. If there were any um, uh, properties that are incorporated within the Wilmette Public Library District boundaries, um, but are not being taxed at that rate for library services, if they are unincorporated, um, then they would be eligible for service. Um, however, uh, to date, we do not believe that we have anyone, but if we did and someone were to apply, um, our method would have been to um, tax them at the same rate that we do our residents. Uh, so what we do is we adopt annually the tax bill method. And that has been our process for as long as this statute has been in place. Okay, is there a motion to adopt? Oh, I move to adopt the uh, resolution. Okay, Trustee Nealon has moved to adopt the resolution. Is there a second? I second. Okay, Trustee Summer has seconded. Fina, I saw you raise your hand. Did I miss something? I just had a question, if you don't mind. I know I'm familiar with this from um, passing it in the past. Would you mind giving me an example of how, you know, how this could come about? <clears throat> A resident moves here or maybe is is really out of state and has a need i'm sorry if they they're if they're a member if they're in the village of wilmette that's not it what's happened is if they're not paying wilmette taxes or kenilworth taxes because we've got the agreement with kenilworth and then if they're not paying wilmette taxes nor do they have a library card because they live in an incorpor unincorporated area so no one is collecting taxes for them for library service then that might be in Anthony, you've mentioned a couple of unincorporated areas. There may be some unincorporated areas, but it doesn't appear that they're residential. Um, I, a good example is actually outside of our community. Um, so um, I can give you two examples. Glenview is a great example. Glenview has a number of unincorporated areas mm -hmm. um, within the, the village of Glenview. Um, so folks who want to get a library card in Glenview um, would need to apply for one through the non-resident fee card. Um, because they're not part of the actual taxing body or uh, taxing area. They're not taxed on their real estate bill for their library services, so they would need to pay for a card. Um, so that's a, a local example. When I was director at the Palatine Public Library District, um, folks who lived in the Inverness community um, would pay for their services um, that way. Uh, because they were not, not able to get their services elsewhere. Um, but their uh, library was actually the, the Palatine Library because their high school district that they, they sent their kids to um, was District 211, which was the, the, the high school district that was served within the Palatine uh, Public Library District. And that's the way that the code is written, is that wherever um, you send your kids to public high school is the community in which you would be um, purchasing your library card from. So... Um, you know, Winnetka has a couple unincorporated areas um, and that those areas um, actually folks who live in that area would, um, there, there are some addresses in Wilmette uh, that are in the, uh, that are actually have a, I'm, I'm rambling. I, it's, I, Ron just sent a note chat to everybody. He said, there are parts of the new church township that are unincorporated. These are the areas that would be impacted now. Yeah. So if they're not paying taxes, gotcha. And thank again, you, the, 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 the case of the matter is, is that right now we, we and historically we have not had anyone who's participated in this. However, it is a state requirement that we adopt this on an annual basis. Thanks, Anthony. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. The motion's on. Trustee Barshis, would you do the roll call? Mm -hmm. Barshis. Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Needlin? Yes. Trustee O'Keefe? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Summer? 
Yes. Trustee McDonald. Yes. Okay. So we move second and passed unanimously. Okay, we're going to uh, turn it over to Director Austin, and he's going to. Uh, it's a purchase approval for the uh, RFID in terms of uh, automated material handling system update, and so we get, we've got quite a few, a bunch of information in the packet, and so. Sure. Thank you, Lisa. I'll give you all a brief overview of what we're talking about here today and um, what the history of this project has been. So as you know, um, last fall, we adopted um, a proposal um, following an RFP to work with Biblioteca to secure our radio frequency identification inventory program here at the library. This has been a part of our long range special reserve fund plan for well over a decade. Um, it's been memorialized in our resolution amending a plan um, and has had a dollar figure attached to it of approximately $300,000 over the, you know, as an estimate over the course of the last decade or more. Uh, last fall, when we adopted this project, we adopted it in, in multiple parts um, simultaneously, including the scope of tagging the entire collection. Um, putting in uh, new self-checkout stations. We purchased five new self-checkout stations, a number of RFID pads that will be used by staff to check out materials at the circulation desk, as well as to add tags to the material that we're adding to the collection in the technical services department. Um, a number of inventory wands that will allow us to keep track of the inventory of the collection and the addition of um, uh, RFID security gates at the entrance of the library, as well as an elective option to include an automated material handling system. The automated material handling system, which is what we're talking about here tonight, um, is an interesting element of this whole process. Um, AMHs, um, the, the intent behind the AMH is to facilitate the check-in of material. Um, so while we're able to do a lot of self-checkout and automated checkout without having to find the barcodes on items uh, going forward when we light up the RFID system, and I'll say more about that here uh, later in the report, um, the uh, AMH actually um, helps us with the most laborious part of the process, which is checking materials in. And when we're quarantining all of our returns right now, those things amass in a lot of bins, and it's uh, quite a project to get uh, the materials checked in on a daily basis. We also participate in um, uh, reciprocal borrowing with other members of the, cons uh, the CCS consortium, as well as through rails and interlibrary loan. So there's a lot of materials that are coming in and out of the building on a daily basis that staff handle manually. And that is an ergonomic concern. Um, so one of the ways that we could take full advantage of the new RFID systems capabilities is to integrate an automated material handling system. The challenge that Wilmette Library has had over time is that we are kind of geographically bound by um, various walls within the building and we're limited in terms of where we can implement such a system. When we put together the RFP last year, um, we added this as an elective because not every vendor that prepares um, bids for these types of products has a system that is modular. Um, Biblioteca did, and in fact, Biblioteca did send out a representative to take field measurements um, of, our, of our space and determined that there was a way that we might be able to adopt an automated material handling system um, in a small scale um, before we introduce a larger scale system sometime down the road with a future renovation. Uh, that was very alluring to us and we presented that as an option and the board approved that last fall um, in October when we approved this project. Uh, that portion of the project um, was to be installed at the front, near the front entrance of the library where the three book returns are on the west entrance. Um, those materials would be a patron induced system, meaning the patrons would return their items to a single slot on the exterior of the library, and then those items would be checked in um, via a conveyor belt system inside the building behind the circulation desk, which would then sort the items into one of three bins, and uh, that would then direct the staff to either shelve them or to put, the, put them on the hold shelf or to send them on to the next library. Um, so that we really appreciated that solution. We thought it was great. We started moving forward with this whole process. And at the 11th hour, we um, noted um, that, in fact, uh, when we saw the, the final drawings for this, that it called for a structural wall that the library doesn't have. Um, we don't have a brick wall at the entrance where they were drawing a brick wall that we were going to mount this um, new book slot into. And we didn't realize that there would be a construction element of, the, of this whole mm -hmm. project. To remediate that and install that, um, that interface, that wall, 
Um, the construction, well, we didn't even go down that road in estimating it because it would be fairly costly and we simply don't have the resources to be able to implement that within the time frame that we have identified. So we scrambled. Um, what we were trying to determine is, is there a way that we can still, while we committed to purchasing $54,000 worth of automated material handling equipment, is there a way that we can still use that equipment and adapt it somewhere else in the library so that we can take advantage of this purchase now and move forward with this automated material handling system? Um, so we analyzed a number of options. We looked throughout the library. I talked with a number of staff. And we determined that, in fact, we did have a space that we thought would be eligible for this. And we took some field measurements and we determined that we do have, in fact, have a solution that we can implement now. So rather than waiting to um, full fledged adopt this system a few years down the road when we renovate the first and lower level of the library, what we're presenting to you this evening is an amended version of our proposal for the automated material handling system that allows us to take advantage of it today. The difference is this particular system is a larger scale system. It is not a patron induced system. In fact, this is a staff induced system. The overwhelming majority of the returns that come into the library, in fact, don't come in through the front entrance of the library. They come in through the parking lot book drops. In fact, the three book drops at the front entrance of the library have been closed since the library initially closed early in the pandemic back in March of 2020. Uh, 2020. Um, so the majority of our returns come in through the parking lot, approximately 80% of our returns in fact come there, as well as um, back of house we also receive all of our delivery bins from rails, um, our ILL items and so on uh, come in through, the, through um, the back as well. So in fact staff does most of the induction of our returns anyway. So what we're, trying to, what we're trying to do, in fact, here is to capitalize on the fact that the overwhelming majority of our items are coming in through the parking lot and the system that we're proposing would take advantage of that. So what we're looking at is a repurposing of the space that is currently being used for parking lot pickup and can continue to be used in that purpose. Um, that is our former shelving room. The shelving room um, has enough square footage to accommodate the implementation of this conveyor belt system, which is pictured in the, um, the schematics that are in your packet. And we've got uh, the drawings in there that kind of reflect uh, what the footprint of this would be. We configured it in a few different ways, and this is the way that we think matches our, our workflow the best. There's a trough on one end of it um, that essentially we would dump all of our materials into. The materials then make their way up the conveyor belt on a one, one by one basis. Um, and they make this critical um, right turn as they, as they go up that, that's part of the system. It has to make a right turn. Um, and then it passes the computer, it reads the RFID chip, and then it will be sorted into one of five bins. So we actually have the capability with this space to expand the system and to customize it a little bit more to better meet what the staff's needs would be and to facilitate the return and check-in of, of those items and get them back on the shelves more effectively. So what we would do is then sort these items into the bins. So if it's an adult fiction item, it would drop into one bin. If it were going upstairs to the youth department, it would go into another bin. If it were destined for another library, it would get separated and put in the exceptions bin. If it were a hold item, it would be handled a little bit differently and being sorted into another bin. Then the staff would then come by and uh, the bins that were ready to shelve, um, like the adult and youth items, can go right onto a, a cart by, by, with our shelvers. They can be sorted, brought right upstairs and shelved. Uh, the items that are more of the exception type material that get sorted to go elsewhere would be then processed accordingly. Um, and we could uh, facilitate all that operation and workflow out of that same space that, that we're proposing here. Um, obviously, there's additional equipment involved in this and there are some costs associated with that. There's also the challenge of the fact that um, the, uh, uh, the discoveries related to the, uh, the um, inability of us to take advantage of the first proposal has led to some restocking fees. We've done what we can to negotiate with Biblioteca about this. This is a design to build system. So the pieces that were created for us were designed specifically for Wilmet Library. Um, and as they were already sent out and we refused them, um, there is a bit of a fee that's associated with the restocking of them. They are extending us the exact same pr um, pricing that they offered to us last October when this was proposed. So we are still taking advantage of their um, competitive pricing as far as that's concerned. And uh, they are absorbing some of the costs of the shipping um, to help us out there. Um, I do feel that what we've got here before us this evening is a solution that is 
advantageous for the library. I think it's unfortunate that we're coming at this kind of um, in a roundabout way. I would love to do things um, by design rather than by default. Um, but um, I think we caught this one just in time before it was installed. And we have the, the ability now to, to really take full advantage of the RFID system when we light this up and to be able to take advantage of some of the labor saving and ergonomic centered um, functionality of the system in an effort to try to you know, improve our workflows and efficiencies and get this material back on the shelves and into people's hands in a more uh, efficient and effective manner. Uh, so that's my, my spiel about that, and I'll entertain any questions that you've got about the automated material handling system. Questions? Bina? Thanks, Anthony. I can imagine the staff must be excited as well if it improves, you know, the workflow and, 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 and labor lines. Um, have they voiced any, you know, so far any kind of training or kind of hardships, lessons learned that might help this second phase? Um, this has really just been kind of handled at the managerial level at this point. Um, the frontline staff um, have not been trained on the system. It's a very different system than what we were initially proposing. Um, but the training on it is, is going to be very basic. Um, maintenance of it will be done under uh, an agreement with Biblioteca. That was the original design. So we don't need to be masters of the actual uh, nuts and bolts aspects of the technology. Um, we just need to be able to, to operate it. And it's a fairly it kind of runs itself by design. That's the way that this operates. Um, obviously, there, there, there may be some concern about um, what does this mean from a personnel standpoint? Um, does this, you know, was this designed with the intention of trying to um, have machines replace humans? Uh, no, that is not the design at all. We talked about that early on in this process when we adopted the system back in October. Um, this is an opportunity for us to work smarter. Um, the, the role of the library right now is to work on building relationships and to focus less on the transactions that we're doing. Um, by not looking at barcodes, we, we spend more time looking at our, our, our public and we're able to build more relationships and provide better customer service. By getting our material checked in in a more effective way without having to um, have repetitive motion and potential damage to our employees, we're able to more effectively process our, our resources and, and get things into people's hands more effectively. So that's kind of what's behind all of that. Um, Thanks, Trish. Trustee Neelan. I have a question. Um, I think the purpose and you know uh, the way that it will ultimately begin to flow is like a it's a really good plan. But um, uh, basically, uh, my main concern is why is the library absorbing absorbing any costs on this at all? Uh, if it is um, okay, like for uh, one of your things that you noted, Anthony, in your report was that other vendors, when they um, uh, answered the RFP, said that they uh, were unable to spec for the automatic um, materialist system because of the way the library was set up. This uh, biblioteca went ahead and said that they could do it. And then they said they couldn't do it. And now they're charging us. So I'm wondering well, but it's not so much that they that. couldn't do it. It's, it's that the library couldn't accept it as it is without doing further remediation and construction to facilitate the system that they had proposed. Um, I well, think did it, I'm sorry, but didn't they see that first when they came out? Like, I, I guess I'm just saying like, why, why is there any cost at all to the library? Because it's their design. They're the design build contractors and they're not giving us what we asked for. It's a great question and a point very well taken. Um, I do believe that the library and Biblioteca both bear responsibility for, for the miss on this one. Um, there were a number of contingencies on this project that were unfortunate. I, I don't wanna get into a lot of the detail about that here on the call, but the project manager that we worked with initially on the project was dismissed a, a couple months into our project. I think a couple things got missed in the process. Um, so Biblioteca acknowledges some responsibility for, for their aspect of that, and that is why they're, they're working with us on the pricing and that they're absorbing some of the costs. We are under contract. We did sign a contract with them, and we are bound by the terms of that contract, and that does accept that we, if we have to return any form of the equipment, we are subject to restocking fees. That's a piece that I could not negotiate out of this because that's part of the legal document. Mm -hmm. I actually have a couple questions. I know yes. we've talked. Um, so they have done final measurements. They've actually come out. So this is, you're comfortable now with this new one that they have come. There, there isn't a hidden brick wall missing or anything like that. 
This system is all entirely um, is, is a system that will be built inside the room. It does not require any other construction. It doesn't require a support wall. It just requires a data cable and an electrical cable and enough, okay. and enough clearance to go around the system. And all those measurements have been taken. Okay. Uh, my next question is, um, so there won't be any construction in the staff in the staff room, other than just like they'll build it within the staff. Okay. Correct. Is the management fee for the new new piece the same because it's a bigger complex machine? The maintenance is the same for the system okay. as it was for the other. Okay. Okay, I have another question. <laughs> So I just want to confirm, originally the, the cost and what was approved by the board was, the original bid was 173,000 and the board approved max of 175. Does that sound right in October? So now the total of the whole project will be 255. Does that sound right? It's an additional 80,000-ish more. Correct. Correct. Okay. And that falls within that document that you and I talked about, the, um, it's called, it was a, it's a resolution amending a plan for the thing. And that's contained within that part of, as an anticipated long-term use of the reserve fund. Correct. Is that correct? Okay. And that was in one area, it's, you gave a budget of 300,000. So it's still within using that amount of something that was previously approved. Correct. Okay. Also, uh, Trustee Nealon, it expedited the processing because I don't, before it was going to be downstairs, now it's going to be upstairs, plus you don't have the construction cost. Well, there was no real place to really build a wall and the cost of adding a wall, there wasn't any place to build it. So, and I think that with uh, Bibliotech, while, while, while we have them, is I think they're the only one that does, are they, and you can, is that the only company that does a modular one? That was the RFID other thing that was, this. yeah, and that, that was, was the, the selling other point. Reason. So we can grow into this. If, if we renovate in the future, if we find an opportunity to in, um, introduce a patron induction system, it could even tie into this. I've seen models um, that they've, they've shown us a number of ways that this could be configured. If in the future um, we move walls around, we move departments, we have a way that we can build into this and um, have a... Uh, another bit of equipment that we could add on to it that would allow a patron induced part of the system as well, it can be built right into the system. So this is a, a fully modular system that we can grow with over time. So the staff is on the second floor? This is this is on the second floor, not the first floor? This is on the first floor. So there isn't going to be any problem, I'm just trying to anticipate questions, of like building this on the second floor with getting the equipment up there because um, it's modular. They won't have any the, the construction, Biblioteca won't have any problem getting it up there and ensuring that it can. To be clear, it's going on the, the ground level of the library, first floor. Okay, that's, that's what I thought. Lisa it can stays kind of on because, the ground level, right? Yes. Right by the window where the, where the library parking lot picket. It's not going to be on the second floor. No. Gotcha. Okay. And you're okay. confident with, I just had a question. You're confident with the current Biblioteca managers and oversight of this so um, uh, an unfortunate situation doesn't occur again. We've got a really great team that we've been working with um, since say February when when uh, the hands changed. Uh, we, we've been getting incredible personal service. I've been working with uh, that team and have weekly meetings with them. Um, we do regular check-ins, email correspondence. They've been great. I have another I mean, question. Say, oh, oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, so okay, mine's still back to the finance stuff. So the three hundred thousand. So we did the capital, the big um, capital reserve study, which is separate from this. This three hundred thousand is not included in that. Correct. Correct. So we all, as the trustees, have to be mindful that this is additional. Although it's in the master plan, it is not in the seven point seven million dollar capital reserve. I don't know. Um, there are a number of things that, in fact, were not included in the capital reserve fund plan that were also part of our resolution amending a plan. So okay. replacement of the telephone system infrastructure is, is an example. Um, the renovation of the first and lower level is an example of um, something that was not included in the capital reserve plan. The capital reserve plan is simply 
um, the continued maintenance of the existing building and all the attached systems of infrastructure. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Yep. Uh, Joan, did you have a question? I, well, I did because it, it, to me, it just seems somewhat sim to, simply to say it's um, making lemonade out of lemons in the sense that it didn't work maybe, but I think by getting a bigger system, um, it, it facilitates um, our needs, I think, and, and our patrons' needs. So I, I think that it it's, wasn't quite how we anticipated, and the cost is a little bit more. But in the long run, I think the benefit is, is totally win-win. So I, I, I'm all for it. But just Neil. Neil, wait a minute. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start. Wait a minute. I'm gonna start calling on each one of you. Trustee Neil, and then we'll do Trustee O'Keefe. I just feel like I need a little more time with this. Um, I was away for the weekend, and you know, didn't have time to uh, really absorb it. And um, uh, I have an architect in the family who uh, you know does design build, and you know, uh, he put you know he just uh, had me asking a lot of questions that I'm not sure I can get out here. But uh, I would love to talk. A little more about it and if if necessary could we take more time with this maybe have a special uh, meeting uh later depends on I, what the rest of the trustees want to do it's all up. i would really like for us to take action on this tonight this is going to take 14 weeks for fabrication and we want to launch this thing as soon as possible upon the heels of the uh, construction project in august uh, the sooner we can implement this um, the better um, I would love to, to entertain any more questions you've got or any concerns that you may have tonight so that we can try to move this forward. Trustee O'Keefe? I'm sorry, I was just going to clarify that this is not a patron base. This is going to be more of a staff, uh, a staff system. Correct. Um, and, and inevitably it may assist with patrons, but this is now, it has been changed from patron usage to staff usage. Yeah, so just to kind of talk you through what that means. So the, the way that this would have worked um, on the exterior of the building from a patron experience would be you would return your items one at a time into a conveyor belt. There would be one book drop instead of three. Um, and there would be a digital display monitor on the outside that would then display each item one by one as you're returning them. And then you would have the option once you're done to print a receipt of the items that were returned. That was the system that we had initially spec'd. The system that we're working with now um, is not a patron-induced system. Patrons will continue to return books the way that they always have directly into our book drops, and then staff will take the bins of those materials and dump the bins into a trough, where then a machine will then go through and, and process all of those items automatically. Um, it's probably a more efficient system. I mean, a little bit biased in, in how I'm saying this here, but um, I've observed this. Um, I've done it myself at my home library. Um, if, I'm, if I am a patron behind um, a family that's returning all their um, picture books that they've checked out, by, for example, because this has happened to me, um, the kids are returning their items one by one. I have one item to return and I'm waiting behind someone that has a basket of items that they're trying to return. Um, it's not the most efficient system as far as that's concerned. It does give the patron confirmation that their item is returned, but that's the patron induction system is it is a one at a time item processing system. The staff induction system works behind the scenes. The patron doesn't really have to deal with anything. Uh, they simply return all their items to the bins as they would, and then staff dumps the materials into the, the system back of house and processes the items. Um, moves a little bit more efficiently. Uh, the patrons don't have to wait for anything. They just don't get a receipt. At some point in the future, we'd like to be able to offer that capability. Uh, this just isn't the time for that until we can do an actual renovation that would accommodate that. But that's, that's the difference between the patron versus staff induction model. Trustee uh, Summer? Um, one thing that I wanna mention that when you and Anthony and I talked, and I wanna ask a question, are 80 about 80 percent of the returns are done in the book drop in the parking lot is that correct, correct. still yes and is that also the case the way it was even pre-pandemic is that generally where the majority of the returns come 
It's true. Um, the majority of our returns come to the three bins in the parking lot. We have remote book drops at um, the Park District, Plaza del Lago, and CTA, as well as the front entrance of the library. Those are, are, are used on a far less volume than the ones in the parking lot. That's the primary destination and has been for the longest time. So that being the case, um, it would seem that this, whether we ever get the patron induced, this would be a better system because we're processing many more of our returns because you'd be able to use it for the ones from Plaza de Lago, from CTA, because they'd be in a bin, you could dump the bin into the chute and away they go, as opposed to the small system, which is like a starter system. This one would be much more higher volume in processing. Is that you correct? got it. Okay. That's it. I, I think if we would, if we knew that we had the space to accommodate such a system at the time that we were drafting this request for proposals, if that space were in fact eligible, um, we were, you know, we were in the middle of the pandemic. That room was filled at the time with um, additional bookshelves, with our parking lot pickup model. It was just very busy. Um, when we reopened, we took down a lot of that shelving. We've shifted that model and that space, we had fresh eyes. We saw an empty room. Uh, we saw an opportunity here. Um, I think we might've thought about this differently had we, had we thought that we had the ability to build that system inside that room at the time that we did the RFP last fall. Hmm. Yes. Steele Keith. Question, please. What's uh, not having been on the board back in October, what's the lifespan of this new AMH uh, system? Um, well, it's More not, than I mean, a year? oh my gosh, yeah, no, this equipment will last a very, very long time. Um, I, I, I can't tell you how long I think it's going to last, but at least 10 years, um, you know, having, having seen these systems in place at a number of our peer libraries, this is a, this is a fixture of so many libraries in our area. Um, even Little Bonetka has a, has a system like this at, at their library. Um, Highland Park's got a system. My home library, Mount Prospect, has a system that they've been using for over a decade. Um, they endure. Trustee sure. Summer? Sorry, all the questions. I just want to make sure the staff is okay giving up some of the staff space in that room. Yeah, I mean, this is, we, we've talked about this in staff. Um, I've, I've worked closely with my management team about this. Um, it, it will shift some workflows. And, um, you know, we, we've, the, the, the short answer to that is in the last year, we've had to shift so many of our operations around. Um, the, the two desks that live in that room normally are the manager's desk for shelving and switchboard, who's on this call, that's Patsy. And um, she has agreed that she can relocate her desk. The other desk that was in that space was our switchboard, which is our telephone system. Uh, that is the next major infrastructure system that the library is going to replace. You may recall that last year we were working in partnership with the Village and Park District to partner to have our system replaced. Unfortunately, that didn't come to pass, but the plan at that time was to abandon the switchboard module and to move to a different model for our phone system. So those two operations that had a desk based in that room um, are modular. We're, we're going to be able to work within that. And I think long range, again, we need to keep this, this in mind. When we renovate the first and lower level of the library, we definitely need to be thinking differently about how we allocate our space. We're very limited in the type of space that we have for staff on the, um, particularly on the first floor of the library. The circulation department really does not have an office. Um, that is the main reason why it is so hard for us to find a location for the AMH. Um, there's really no workroom for the circulation staff. The shelving staff have this room that they've worked out of, but the real estate that's allocated to it is primarily dedicated to the carts that move in and out. That's going to be true of the space when it, you know, when this gets implemented, uh, there'll still be a lot of carts in that space. It will not be an office that, that you can like sit down at a computer and, and like write reports in. That's not the purpose of that office space. We still need space like that. Um, so that will be one of the overarching goals of the, of the space plan for um, the first floor renovation will be to try to accommodate the staff a bit better. And Patsy, if I'm speaking out of turn, Kim, you're both on the call here. If you want to pipe in and say anything about that, you're more than welcome to do so. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you want to confirm or deny, you're, you're, you're more than welcome to do so. Does anyone else have any questions that they'd like to ask about the AMH? Uh, one of the things you had said when we talked 
Director Austin, was that this moves us a little bit far in advance because one of your goals long term was to do the staff induced model, but you didn't know how it was going to happen without the renovation. Correct. And yeah, so, so this this does help us to move forward with the plan that we had a few years down the road. Um, we thought that we were getting an early start on it by introducing the AMH um, at the front, but by being able to do that here now back of house, um, we're really going to be able to achieve some efficiencies in our operations and truly take advantage of the benefits of this RFID system that we've invested in. It's really kind of alluring. Uh, it's quite exciting for us. So how much disruption if it didn't get passed tonight? Because I know Trustee Nealon said, you had said it takes 14 weeks, you were backing it up. How much time does it take and what's the construction process like? Uh, the construction is, I mean, it, they, they say it'll be done in a day when they bring it in. It's just a, a you know, it's a series of conveyor belt systems. That's kind of like, I mean, it's kind of like Legos. I mean, you just kind of lay these things out. It's modular. Um, they, they lock into place with one another. I'm oversimplifying it, I'm sure. But um, it, it would be installed within a day. Um, they would test it. We would start running our system through and we could be taking advantage of it within a day of it being implemented. So if it was stalled in terms of additional discussion, it wouldn't be disruptive from a building standpoint. From an installation standpoint? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, we'd just be, we would be pushing it back. But I guess I, I would need to understand better what, um, what the concerns are ab about it. We've, we've laid a lot of information out before you and I'll answer every question that you need tonight. No, I was um, just saying in, ter in terms of what, uh, I was just trying to figure out because you'd said, well, it used 14 weeks. And so I was just trying to take that discussion a little further as to what. Sure. Was I, I think Bibliotech is holding the pricing for us, I think is part of the deal. I mean, they're they're extending this for us. Um, we're already kind of six months past the time when uh, they established this pricing. I imagine that they're probably taking a little bit of a hit on the markup. Um, some of this technological equipment, I believe that the pricing has gone up on those things because of some of the chipsets that are involved in it. Um, uh, commodities have gone up. So I think that that's, I think part of their thing is they're, they're likely absorbing some, some of the cost um, in offering us the extension of this pricing at this time. I don't know how long they're going to be able to honor the pricing that they propose to us, I guess, is what I'm saying. Okay. Um, Thank you. Well, yeah, I think um, Trustee McDonald, you were just asking about timing, which is, which is good. Um, I guess the other question I have is like, um, and you know, I'm, I know I'm, uh, seem a little bit like a hardball person on this, but I'm just wondering like, what is in a contract that makes you owe something for something that you didn't get? You know, I mean, like what we, you know, you know what I mean? Like how, how can we be contractually obligated? Well, we contracted to purchase a product that we refused. Uh, but it wasn't what you needed. So, I mean, like, it, I guess, I mean, um, was the contract reviewed legally or, I mean, I, I guess that's just my question for the public. I think it was what we signed, discussion. it's what we signed off on. And if we signed off on it without noticing that, and generally all our contracts are reviewed by legal, but the legal is not a designer and I guess mm -hmm. we're liable for it. And so this was a negotiation to get something that would work without mm -hmm. causing, because it would work if we were willing to bear the cost of a wall, a bearing wall. For yeah. And um, where might but, that go and when that would happen, who knows? And, and but it seems like their bid was incorrect. That's, I mean, I'm, you know, I mean, I think that, that the solution sounds good to me, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm not saying, you know, that I'm definitely, the, you know, not going to vote for this or anything, but I'm, but I'm still like trying to wrap my head around, you know, um, why they are, why they seem to have so much of the upper hand and, you know, like making us pay for things that, you know, we're not receiving. You mean the restocking cost? Yes. Mm -hmm. That he negotiated down the half because he sent it back and because of delivery charges. I guess the, and okay. the rec doc, I guess that was the best that he can negotiate with if you've got a proprietary product and there's nobody else that makes one that's modular. So, I guess the alternative is, is we accept the system that we've got and then we put it in the basement until we have such a time that we can build onto it and um, accommodate it. I mean, that is your alternative, is that you just, um, we accept the equipment, 
Um, we pay the, the shipping again to have it brought back to us and we don't install it. I mean, I, I mean, I don't mean to, to sure. kind of say I'm going to take my ball and go home, but that really is, I mean, that's kind of, that's your alternative right now is um, you can accept the equipment that we can't install. Um, and then we can sit on it until such a time that we renovate, or um, we can make the investment that we were planning to make in a couple of years on an escalated schedule and do that now. So we can take advantage of the system as soon as possible. And, you know, I've done what I can to negotiate with this vendor within the limits of the contract that we've signed. Any other discussion? Did anyone like to make a motion? I, well. I so move that we accept the second phase installation for an additional $80,000, $80,842. I second the motion. Any more discussion? It's been moved by Trustee Fishman and seconded by Trustee McDonald that we uh, approve the second phase of the installation for 80,842. Can we have a call, roll call? Mm -hmm. Trustee Barshus, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Nealon? Yes. Trustee O'Keefe? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Summer? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. Thank you. It's okay. been moved and seconded unanimously. Now moving on to the contract for preventive maintenance agreement with Hill Mechanical Services. Director Austin? Thank you. Um, so what we have here is the preventative maintenance agreement for our HVAC services. Um, we've been with Hill Mechanical since the uh, renovation in 2015-16. Um, this is a, um, a slight increase over what we've had um, uh, in the previous year. Um, we're generally satisfied with Hill Mechanical. I will say that this is um, a time for us to reevaluate our services here in the next year. We typically let our contracts go for about five years um, before we uh, go back out for RFP. And I think it is time for us to do so. Um, it is going to be an extrapolated process for us to go out and do that search. We're going to need some more time. Um, so as such, we're recommending just a one, one year renewal with Hill uh, to get us through this next year while we put together our proposal and uh, or our request for proposals rather, and then do our more comprehensive search. Um, the other factor that's kind of uh, motivating us at this time too is that our site technician, who's been really great for us um, with Hill Mechanical, has moved on um, to another venture and is no longer servicing us. Um, mm -hmm. And the technician really and truly is where that relationship is built. They get to know your system and your organization really well. Um, so we'd like to try to establish a relationship, if not with a new technician within Hill Mechanical, uh, potentially with another vendor um, after we do a bit more of that investigative research here in the next year. So um, essentially what we're looking for is a, a one year extension of the current agreement that we've got uh, while we do some more research and try to plot out the future. Uh, Fina. Anthony, um, I was wondering if the extension um, has have, has it been shorter at any time, um, and if oh, I blanked on my second question. So that's it, I guess, for now. How, if we need more time, I, I understand. Um, you know, we may consider more more um, vendors and. Is there any other, my second question was, oh, is there any other technician that can do a short term um, maintenance uh, contract besides uh, this one, besides Hill? Um. I think it would be it would be too much of a challenge for us to try to identify that person on su such short notice. Um, you know, this contract expires at the end of the month. We're satisfied with the service that Hill provides us. They're familiar with our building and our systems. Um, we really don't have a good reason just to just kind of pull out from um, our agreement with them. I think it might actually put us in a, a more compromised position right now if we had to go out and try to find a completely new outfit to get it, get to know us this um, over the course of the next year. Uh, so this is a good way for us to buy a little bit of time. 
um, and uh, do our research and, and really put together a good package to uh, solicit some better bids. Um, but in terms of, I think maybe at the beginning of that is, you know, should we go for less than a year with Hill Mechanical? Um, uh, a year is the, is the shortest um, agreement term that they would offer. And that's pretty typical for HVAC companies. Trustee O'Keefe? Uh, just one question. The technician who left or the person who was supervising, have they been able to get another technician up to speed on the library's facilities and all of the, you know, various parameters for the facilities? Yes, they have. Thank you. Any other questions? Is there a motion that we... I motion to approve the contract with Hill Mechanical for 27054. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second that, Trustee Fishman. Gotcha. Trustee Summer has moved that we uh, ex go uh, accept the 12 month contract for 27054 for with uh, Hill Mechanical Services and Trustee Fishman has seconded it. Any additional discussion? It's been moved and seconded. Can we have a roll call? Mm -hmm. Trustee Barshes? Yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Nealon? Yes. Trustee O'Keefe? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Summer? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. Thank you. We're now moving to our discussion items and you've gotten of all the uh, Bruja with the Illinois and this CDC, you got a, a note from Director Austin, and so we're going to turn it over to him so he can tell us about all the calls he may have been getting. <laughs> In terms of all right, so um, what Lisa's referring to obviously is on Thursday, May 13th, the CDC announced that they've updated guidance on masking for those who've been vaccinated. And yesterday, the governor issued an updated executive order um, about the current bridge phase and announcing what that means for the state. Um, once again, public libraries were not specifically mentioned in the governor's executive order. Our guidance is largely included under business nonprofits as well as educational institutions. And that's, when, that's where we've been kind of reading between the lines and basing um, our final decisions about updating our rules and so on um, off of the guidance that they've been providing for businesses, nonprofits, and educational institutions. Um, and basically what they're saying there is that those organizations and units of local government have the authority to establish their own rules. Um, and that is what so many public libraries have done and continue to do. Um, so because our operations are informed by the Department of Public Health, Cook County Department of Public Health, and related guidance from the state library, our affiliate systems, and even the Illinois Board of um, Education, um, and monitoring our, our peer organizations, um, at this time, we are recommending that our service model will remain the same for now and for the remainder of this fiscal year through June 30th. Um, specifically, inside the library, mask wearing will remain in place and social distancing will be maximized to the greatest extent possible. Um, the introduction of in-person outdoor programming for children this summer will follow that same guidance as our indoor activity. That is our current plan. Now, we do know that um, the state is likely going to make an announcement about moving into phase five, which is the point at which um, the economy is deemed to be fully reopened with safety precautions continuing. Uh, that's the language that's in the Restore Illinois plan uh, that was set forth and that the library has been following since um, its introduction, likely back in April of last year. Um, so we continue to follow that guidance and we will adopt any further changes consistent with uh, the introduction of phase five or in the wake of phase five. Um, right now, we do know that our peer agencies in the community um, are continuing on with their masking. Um, I've looked at the park district's website. Uh, the park district continues to require masks, even in outdoor activities when you're not actively participating in physical fitness related programming. Um, but if you are sitting on the bench, say for example, in a baseball game, you're still expected to be wearing your mask there. Uh, the same is also true um, for District 39 schools. Masks will continue to be required for the duration of the school year. And we anticipate that schools are going to be doing the same with masking in their classrooms going forward for the fall. 
Um, so masking continues to be a norm. And um, I think the overarching piece of this that gives the staff and I concern is that still, while Wilmette is largely vaccinated and we've been done locally a really great job as far as that's concerned, um, only within the last week have those um, ages 12 and up been able to take advantage of vaccinations. But our children in this community have still not been extended an opportunity to gain access to um, vaccinations and are still very much part of the vulnerable populations that do not have access to vaccines. Um, we do feel that as a public institution that is open to the entire community that we need to be inclusive and think about everyone when we're working on our guidance and therefore um, since the mask model appears to be working for us, we're going to continue on with enforcing mask wearing here at the library. I've noticed that a number of businesses around uh, Wilmette downtown, um, as I went out for lunch today, um, still have their signs on their doors um, saying that they require masks for entry. So it is not inconsistent with um, our, our uh, local government institutions and the schools and park districts, but also our local businesses are continuing to require masks for some degree of service, at least still within this bridge phase. Um, so really and truly what our guidance is going to be as we move forward is to focus our efforts on what it's gonna to take to restore our services for our patrons. It's not so much about where we're at with masks at the moment. It's more of where we're at in terms of how we can start extending the number of services that we've had to limit over the course of the last year and to begin with our plans to try to resume some degree of normalcy in extending those operations. So that's what the staff and I are working on right now is trying to identify what are the next steps. Now, obviously one of the pieces that um, we wanna be working towards is a full restoration of our regular operating hours. And I'll talk a bit more about that here in a, in a few moments. Um, but obviously the other piece of it that we're thinking about too is how can we continue to um, reintroduce a number of services that have been limited. So in this bridge phase, um, our plans have been to try to restore seating. Uh, we've been allowed to expand our capacity. So um, we were at 50% capacity. We're now up to 60 with this bridge phase. Um, we've never met our capacity limits, by the way, since we implemented them. So that's been great. Um, patrons really do abide by our recommendations to come in, get your business done and, and to move along, uh, to not linger. However, we do know that some folks likely would like to come in and spend a bit more time, would like to take advantage of some of the resources, maybe do some study or research while they're here, um, and maybe use our computer resources or the Wi-Fi network for more than just an hour. Um, as our capacity increases, we're going to be able to allow that. Um, we've removed some of the shelving on the mezzanine, which has accommodated the uh, reintroduction of some study tables, and we're designating that space as our study area right now. We've got three tables up there with two chairs each. Uh, they're nice, uh, nicely distanced from one another, and our goal is going to be to try to use that as a model for, as we start to reintroduce more seating around the library. Um, over the course of the next couple of weeks, we'll continue to introduce a bit more seating and start to um, have the spaces return back to the way that they were. Um, we need to revisit some of our photographs from when we started to pick up our furnishings because it's been a year without them there. And frankly, you know, actually seeing Lisa's background is reminding me, oh yeah, we did have a table in that one location. And there's some shelving that's up there that actually isn't, isn't up on the mezzanine anymore. So <clears throat> there, there are a number of things that we're going to need to evaluate and maybe we can improve the way that we've allocated our spaces as well. Um, so that's kind of where our energy is focused right now, but a, a number of details still remain for us to sort because staffing is a big piece of all of this. Um, our staff is largely vaccinated, so that's a good piece. Um, at least we, we know that that much has been taken care of, um, but scheduling nonetheless remains a challenge. Um, we're still trying to keep staff working remotely as much as we can, but our goal is to try to get most staff back into the building and working their regular hours inside the library um, before before we get too far into the summer months. Um, uh, we do have construction projects coming up this summer, so there are some advantages to spreading staff out still. So we do have kind of that benefit, again, to the, the theme of trying to make some lemonade. I mean, there, there is that element of all of this here too. Um, but uh, I think that's one of the key pieces is that, you know, a number of our staff still have young children at home who are also affected by a lot of the guidelines that are going on around. And uh, daycare remains an, um, a challenge. Um, we're trying to accommodate schedules and work around this while also simultaneously trying to ramp up and return to service. So there's a number of strains that are placed on the organization that exist just beyond some of these guideline changes that are taking place 
And uh, that's sort of where we're at right now with, with, our, with our planning as far as the, the pandemic response plan goes. Um, do you all have any questions um, about what we are gonna be doing going forward? Um, I, I'll just pause to say that we have updated this information. It is on our website. Um, there is a, a box that's on the front page um, of the site that has been dedicated to our service model this whole time. And that information was updated on Friday when we, when we made this determination in light of what the CDC's guideline recommendation was. Um, Trustee Summer? Are you getting any pushback on the mask? Are any of the staff getting any pushback on that? You know, there, there have been a couple of folks that um, at the front door have resisted a little bit, you know, saying, well, I don't need to, or I'm vaccinated. Um, we certainly don't want to get into the case where we're going to be placed in the position of either having to come up with a mechanism to verify or validate someone's vaccination status. Um, nine times out of 10, everyone's got a mask. Um, they, they, they just need to put it on. Um, and when we, when we tell folks we're still doing this for right now, stay tuned, things may change in the future, but you know, for today, we're going to ask you to continue wearing the mask and follow the guidelines. People have been compliant. I mean, they'll give mm -hmm. you a little bit of pushback uh, up front, but other than that, folks are very compliant. And I would say the overwhelming majority of our patrons remain compliant. When do you think you'll stop isolating the books, materials? Yeah, so we are doing a quarantine right now of 48 hours, um, and we're mm -hmm. going to continue to do that um, for the near future. I, I think um, we're not looking to change that immediately. One of the challenges that we've got there is that we don't want to have to accept returns immediately from patrons at the desk. Uh, that is one of the one of the contingencies of the pandemic that we want to try to work forward through. Um, so I think you know. Partly the introduction of an AMH is gonna to help to facilitate this check-in of materials. So that would be a way for us to move forward with this. So as soon as we can get that implemented, uh, that might be a mechanism by which we could try to process materials more effectively and, and more quickly. Um, but we are gonna continue with the quarantine, maybe not for 48, maybe we'll move to 24 here. Um, we haven't had any issue with, um, you know, patrons aren't getting overdues. So that's, that's a thing. Um, holds are getting processed still rather quickly. Um, turnaround time for in-demand materials seems to be moving pretty effectively. So the quarantine doesn't seem to be affecting service at this time. Okay. Other questions or comments about the pandemic response or anything else related to that? Mm -hmm. And so Anthony, you'll still keep the staff member right in the vestibule and then the big bin yeah, that's, that's the model for the front entrance for right now. And again, part of that is to enforce our safety procedures and to ensure that our, our building capacity is set um, where it is mm -hmm. and uh, that folks are wearing their masks when they come in the building. And uh, we do accept returns there as well as in the parking lot and the, and the remote bins. So when you say the capacity, isn't it right now at 50? Um, we move, in the bridge phase, we moved to 60. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, next we're going to review the Finance Committee uh, met on May 5th uh, with Chair Rogers uh, presiding. And we went over a draft of the fiscal year 21-22 working budget. And basically what, uh, this was the first review and what the library is proposing is a 1% decrease in the overall working budget for fiscal year 21-22. Um, uh, uh, go on. Uh, pardon me. Did you skip project updates? Yeah, we can come back to it. Okay, oh, I'll we'll take a break from Yak. And oh, I'm sorry. Back. Okay. <laughs> just keep going, Lisa. Yeah, just sort of. We'll get we'll get back to it. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. And so basically. Uh, you're going to go on it. The, in, in the past, I think uh, the budget was built looking at 10% or whatever, whereas at this point in time, the budget was put together looking at actual trends and what things were being planned. Is that correct? Correct. Well, we did as a, a, as, as a, a bottom up as opposed to just looking at trends and doing 10% or whatever. Yes, yes, that's true in terms of actual programs. And I, I think uh, Trustee Summer had mentioned that uh, 
personnel was off probably a lot. And I think that's why we probably, the budget will probably come in probably about 10% under what was budgeted. We're, we're at about 9% under right now for the year um, from where we would expect to be. Um, we still have a number of items in the, um, some bigger ticket things coming through um, on the equipment and furnishings lines that I think is going to get us a little bit closer. Um, it's it's kind of hard for me to estimate at this point. I think 10 is sounds a little bit generous. I, I think it's going to be closer to like eight, um, but we're working on it. But it's but it is true that um, we're not going to be able to make up the ground in the personnel line simply because the staff are gone and we haven't we haven't filled those positions or uh, they were filled with positions that we're not paying as much. And so I think because that, that traditionally is what is looked at and there will be another meeting where we will go a little bit more in depth. But Director Austin, are there some things that you'd like to highlight? Yeah. Yeah, I, I do think there are a couple pieces that I think we need to, to share here. So, you know, it's, it's where's my notes? <laughs> here we go. All right. So um, obviously this announcement about um, moving into the bridge phase and on to phase five is, is likely going to escalate um, reintroduction of a number of services and a complete realignment of our plans um, that we were kind of targeting for like uh, maybe the beginning of the second quarter, which may likely coincide with the beginning of our fiscal year here on July 1. Um, so the areas that I think are likely going to be impacted by that are probably the categories of materials and services. Um, we are, we are going to blow that line this year, although we're not going to blow our appropriation, but we will, we will um, come in better than we did, um, than we anticipated as far as uh, the book uh, purchases go. Um, we'll probably have more opportunity for programming as a result. So I think we might need to have staff go back and take a look at our estimates for the coming fiscal year in terms of what we're going to need for programming, because we did reduce that line. Um, I think the, uh, the personnel lines, we need to take another look at those again uh, to be doubly sure before we make the, the final appro uh, um, uh, proposal. And um, there may actually be some more continuing ed or staff development opportunities for us to look at as well. So I think those are a couple lines that came to my attention immediately that we might want to take another look at um, before we, we bring another um, draft proposal up for, um, for review and, and approval in, at the June meeting. Um, as I went down uh, the, other, the, the other categories um, under operations, um, I don't think that we're likely going to need to change um, the, the way that we do our building ops, um, all of those supply lines and contracts and so on, and maintenance fees, I think are all going to be um, pretty much in line. Um, maybe some of the supply lines might change. Um, printing, I think, is still going to be reduced. So um, I, I think our other estimates on the operations side are probably OK, but it's those, those more front-facing um, allocations that we have for materials and services, programming, and the personnel lines, I do think that we'll need to give a bit more attention to those. Trustee Summer? Um, Anthony, where will the new contract for the RFID system, where does that fall? That's well, under what... equipment and furnishings. There's a that's where the computer related equipment lies. Equipment computer is it seventy five? Yeah, there's a there's a maintenance line. Um, it's uh, seven four one five zero. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, Fina. And has has that additional ten thousand been put in there for that for that there that that ten thousand for their annual contract fees in that eighty five thousand? Um, we did pay that within the current fiscal year. There is an allocation, and that's that's in there. Correct. Great. Thank you. Trustee Riddle? I have two questions. I was wondering if there were any other percentage changes considered <clears throat> besides the 1% decrease. Uh, well, the like one tested, do we test any other lower person? You know, I'm sorry, like 2%, 4%. Well, I mean, back to, to Lisa's model, um, it, we didn't start with a number saying we're going to reduce the budget by 1%. Um, we started from the ground up and built oh, what we thought it. we were actually going to be budgeting for the year. And that's how we arrived at the number, which coincidentally was 1% below what we had for the previous year. Okay. Um, and I wanted to know if the committee, I, I'm sorry I wasn't there, but I, I wanted to know if the committee considered 
you know, whether any of these um, kind of the pan the practices of library use would continue past this year, you know, printing materials, for example, might, might that be something that, you know, will continue, uh, you know, the, the lower amount of printing is what I mean, will continue because of the availability that people and the use that people have now of, you know, electronic resources, online resources. We talked about, we asked him, that, we asked that question, and I think they found a good use to use postcards for short things. We're going to be doing the strategic plan. And I think we will present, we will print an annual report this year, small, but it will be going out as opposed to just doing it electronically. So some and of those practices might, you know, that, that might affect the budget, obviously, going forward. Oh, yeah, but that would be that's already, over this year, past this year. <laughs> yeah, that would be into the 21-22 I get the years mixed up, the, the budget year that we're budgeting for in the now, as opposed to now. Director Austin, did you want to talk about what how you came up with some of the, you went with through the department, your department heads, and in terms of looked at what some of their programs might be. Right, so um, yeah, the budget proposal document that you've got shows um, the current fiscal year, our pandemic year, um, and then looks back to prior uh, pre-pandemic years. Um, so you can see that the trending um, and our goal was to try to align our, our budget more closely with what the spending has been and what we actually anticipate the spending will be. Um, and then there's a narrative document that accompanies uh, the budget document that gets into a little bit more detail about how I arrived at those, base, those numbers um, and, and what our estimates are for the coming fiscal year in terms of you know, how, how, we, how we think we're actually gonna get to those numbers. So I think we do need to schedule another meeting. We don't have to do this on the call, but we need to get a doodle poll out there. Um, I'd like for us to target the weeks um, of say June one through eight to hold a meeting um, for this, uh, for the finance committee. Um, and I also believe that we need to schedule another policy committee meeting as well. So um, following this meeting tonight, you'll get an email and um, we, can, we can schedule up some times to get together and resume our business. And Trustee Summer, as treasurer, will be the chair of the Finance Committee. So she will be leading the charge for the budget. OK, thank you. You want to go over your project update? Are okay. there any other questions? Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so project updates. All right, so um, as far as the construction project goes, the capital repair project moves on. Um, the fences came down in the last week um, along Wilmette Avenue, so the sidewalk is reopened. That means that the uh, masonry crew has finished the tuck pointing and brick cleaning work um, and all the uh, sealant repairs on the south side of the building. Um, they've also, um, in the last week, been able to move through the alley and get the three stories of the alley work done. Um, and that's great because uh, they can be done with that. That was kind of a disruptive activity there. It changed the traffic flow and there was a lot of noise um, for our neighbors behind us with, with that work. So we're happy to have that portion of the project done. Today, they went around the corner to the, to the north side of the building and are working between uh, the power lines, um, that the power line easement and uh, the building there. And that's a very delicate process. Um, we've had to work through a number of details to get them to, to the point where they are with that project right now. So that instead of using the lift, they're coming off the roof and going down. It's a little bit more time consuming, um, but it's certainly safer um, than getting zapped when you're in a bucket truck. So, um, so they're, they're taking extra precautions for safety there to get the, uh, the brickwork done on that side of the building. Um, and we're really impressed, continue to be very impressed with their work on the masonry. Um, we think that they're on target for uh, completion of their, of their part of the work here um, by the end of the month, I think. Um, so they're looking pretty great, like they're even maybe a, a, a hair ahead of schedule. Um, we were anticipating that they might be done in early June, so that may still be the case um, pending weather, but um, looking good so far. Uh, the roof work will then follow on the heels of the masonry project. And that will begin in early June, as soon as um, Berglund is done. 
Um, and then also in June, probably in the middle of the month, we're going to welcome our um, general trades crew in to be working on the interior drain installation. Uh, this is the project that's um, on the lower level in the 600s area, where we've had that persistent leak um, with the wet uh, carpeting that's been down there and the fan that's been in the corner for the last many years. Um, we're finally going to address that issue. Um, it's going to be somewhat disruptive, actually, when we finally get to that project. So a little bit about what that's going to look like. What we're going to do is we've got a um, Hallett Movers are going to come in. They're a library moving company, and they, they have a, a patented piece of equipment where they can pick up book stacks that are filled with books, and they can move them. And what they're going to do is push some of the stacks aside so that the crew has the ability to work in that space and do the installation mm -hmm. of the drain. Um, so a portion of that collection will be affected um, when, the, when the stacks get compressed, when two aisles become kind of one, a uh, portion of that collection will be inaccessible um, and it'll be inaccessible to staff. Now, some of that collection will be inaccessible to the public, but will still be accessible to the staff and we can retrieve those resources. And then a whole row of shelves is going to be removed that we're going to have to relocate. And we've installed additional shelving on the lower level near the stairs on the west side of the, of the room. Uh, where we're going to relocate the cookbooks to so that those remain accessible for the duration of this installation. Uh, so that mitigation is going to take place uh, in the middle of the month um, and will likely continue on probably through the 4th of July holiday weekend, uh, I imagine is around the time when they'll be uh, completing that work. Um, in late June, concurrent with that, we're going to see some additional work going on in the building that's going to go on throughout the building. This is our our low voltage electrical work, um, that is the replacement of the fire alarm system, um, the installation of the access control system, which is the automated lock system, as well as um, the updating and replacement of our security camera infrastructure. Uh, so those crews will be able to work inside the library um, in all the affected areas um, while the library is open before and after hours. Um, and we'll just be kind of blocking off the areas that they're working as they go along. Uh, so there will be a bit of disruption, but um, it shouldn't shouldn't affect services too much. We'll scale as much of the services that are going to be adjacent to our public service desks to have that work done outside of the operating hours so that it limits um, disruption to public service. Then, um, then comes um, our big project in August, which is the main shutdown. We'll have more information for you in uh, June about this and what our communication plan is going to be surrounding this particular aspect of the project. Um, but um, this is the most disruptive um, aspect of the entire project, and we're clustering all this within the same two-week time frame in August, our slowest month of the year typically. Um, so the electrical main of the library is going to need full replacement. Um, this is uh, when you stand in the parking lot facing the north side of the building, if you find the power poles, you will see that there is a, a place where that power pole transformer connects to the library. Uh, there's a series of conduit uh, piping that goes down underground. Um, that entire um, panel uh, of piping that comes into the building is going to be abandoned and replaced. There'll be a new electrical cabinet that will be installed and uh, a new set of conduit will be placed inside the library that meets code. And um, we will be re-outfitting all of the equipment um, for the electrical main in the basement, um, a fairly massive project uh, for us to undertake. And concurrent with that, we're going to tidy up a lot of other um, panels throughout the building uh, to upgrade, upgrade them, get them to code. We've got some piping that we're going to be moving around the building. Um, if you've been in the lower level um, and, and have paid attention to where some of the uh, electrical uh, panels are, um, they are kind of out in the open in some spaces. We're going to get them back a house um, so that they don't potentially get tinkered with. Um, number, number of improvements that we're trying to make as a result of this um, as part of the electrical engineering aspect of the project. So that's going to happen in August and it will require the library to be shut down because it's so massive. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that as that plan moves forward. I have not engaged with the electrician about what that plan is. Uh, to date, so but we are still apparently on schedule for that project in August. The other big disruptive thing that's happening concurrent with that um, is the work on the parking lot repair. Uh, so we're talking about the permeable paver parking lot. Um, it's a lot of P's, I always trip all over that, but the permeable paver parking lot will get um, its bricks um, in the drive lane that have kind of uh, created some rutting. Uh, that is going to be pulled up, the substrate will be replaced, 
and a new, um, new gravel will be put down. The bricks will be replaced. Some of the bricks will in fact um, be new bricks. Uh, we'll replace some of them um, and uh, we'll restripe the parking lot as well. Uh, pretty involved process um, to get that, uh, that parking lot work done. That's probably gonna take the entire duration of the time that the electrical main is also gonna be worked on. So trying to cluster those two disruptive things at the same time to reduce impacts. Um, and we'll give you more detail about this um, as the details become more, more clear. Uh, but any questions about any of the capital repair stuff at this point? Okay, uh, so that's the capital project. Um, we're also still working on the RFID project, which we talked a bit about earlier with the AMH. Um, so our tagging team is still going through and tagging the collection and um, making amazing progress. They're doing a fabulous job. We're on the lower level, making our way through the 800s and uh, moving on to the 900s. Um, so kind of making their way towards the, the uh, northwest corner of the building. When they get to that corner, they'll be able to then go back upstairs and finish the media room, which is the last major collection that we have to tag. Um, so that includes the audiobooks, uh, the playaways, the DVD collection, and the compact disc collection. A portion of the CD collection will be uh, repackaged. We talked a bit about that at a previous meeting. Um, we're going to be eliminating uh, the jewel cases for the single and double um, CD sets. Uh, we've got a new system to display those that will be um, easier for both patrons and staff to use. Since we're going to be handling the entire collection for the RFID tagging project, we figured this would be an awesome time for us to also endeavor the repackaging of this collection to make them, I guess, uh, more, more enduring. Uh, there, it'll be a, a system that won't require as much maintenance. Uh, jewel cases break a lot. Um, so especially when they hit the book drop. So these, the system will be a little bit easier for us to manage. And it also has the benefit of taking up less space. So um, we can then consolidate a little bit and um, allocate other space in that media room to collections that circulate a little bit more than the CD collection does. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with that. Um, I'm also pleased to report that the self checkouts um, are now completely operational. We had a few hiccups with our credit card vendor and getting um, that portion of the system up and running, but all seven of our self checkout machines are now up and functional and all have uh, those credit card readers on them to facilitate um, automated payments. Um, we talked about the AMH at length. Uh, that is the, um, the extent of the update on the RFID project. We still think that we're on target for completing this um, by the end of the fiscal year. So I'm very much excited to see this thing moving forward. Any questions about RFID? Oh, a detail I missed. Um, when are we gonna light this thing up? Um, so the goal was um, when the collection is about, you know, 90% tagged is around the time that we feel comfortable enough with being able to turn it on. Um, so we'll have a communication plan set for this to, to coincide to let folks know that they're no longer going to need to look for barcodes on the items when they're checking them out, that they simply need to just set the item down on the self-checkout bed and it will automatically check out. Uh, the readers can read, at, I think, at least five items um, at a time, which is kind of cool. So um, it'll really expedite uh, the whole process of checkout, and pretty soon we'll be able to expedite the check-in process too. Okay, um, that's the project updates. Wait a minute. What percentage of books do you think people are using to self-checkout themselves? Hmm. You can you can tell us that next month. I'll get I, you. The, I'll I've, get you that metric. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious because I've been, <laughs> even I've been doing it. So <laughs> quite a few, I'm, and I would say that the overwhelming majority of patrons who are picking up holds um, will will check them out themselves at the self checkouts that are adjacent to the hold shelf area. Um, a number of folks still love their customer service with their human right at the front desk, and that's great. That's what we're there for. But a lot of folks like the grab and go, especially in the pandemic. Um, a lot of folks have gotten really comfortable with that, and the kids love it. As you know, um, there's there was some detail in last month's report um, about um, the statistical use of the uh, self-checkouts in the uh, youth services department. Far and away the most popular devices in, in the building. Uh, the kids love to check out those materials. Okay, on to my report. Mm -hmm. 
Have you had enough of me yet? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll be brief. Um, so um, as Ron had mentioned at the top of our call today, um, physical circulation of our collections is exceptional and continues to be. Um, for, for May, or for, rather for April, um, sorry, because that's our month that we're looking at. So the complete month of April, um, we were closed in 2020, but our 2019 circulation level was just 9% above where we are today. Um, so with reduced hours in the middle of a pandemic, um, we're still performing exceptionally well and right on pace with the circulation numbers that we would have seen at our pre-pandemic levels. So our community is very much still very engaged with our collections and values their physical materials. Um, that said, our digital resources continue to boom. Um, our overdrive collection is circulating like mad, um, incredibly popular, as well as um, the downloadable services like Hoopla and Canopy. Um, a number of collections have been on the move um, in the last couple months as we've been kind of pivoting um, a number of our operations. Um, the mezzanine, as I mentioned early on, has kind of shifted. We're trying to get all of our collections off of the mezzanine and make that a more de dedicated um, reading and study space. Uh, we're getting close. Um, the, next, the next collection to move out of there um, is the oversized collection. In fact, that's the final collection to move off of there. Um, it is destined for the lower level outside of um, BDU. Um, we're looking to um, fill out that corner down there. Um, it's a great location for the oversized collection and that it's the perfect size. Um, but it also, um, since the oversized collection uh, represents the entirety of the, the uh, nonfiction collection on the lower level is kind of a distinct collection unto itself. Um, it, it's nice that it kind of blends in and bridges um, the beginning of the nonfiction collection there, as well as the tail end in the 900s room. So it's a good location for it. So kudos to um, our shelving team for coming up with that idea. Um, let's see. What else have I got in my report? Um, happy to report that our, our um, partnership with District 39 um, to uh, get all of our K through eight students registered for their first library cards. Um, in the first year of us offering this service, we've registered 334 students, um, which is really outstanding. Um, so we really enjoy that partnership and we're looking to grow that as we move forward. Um, Programming, still doing really great with our virtual programs. Our patrons really enjoy it. We know that going forward, we're gonna have to have some sort of a hybrid model for our programming. And that's the big challenge that our staff has going forward is to determine which programs will be offered um, in person, which one will be remote, and which ones will we have the ability to potentially offer in some sort of a hybrid format where folks may be able to participate virtually as well as in person. Um, so in our first year of offering virtual programming, so April um, 2020 was the very first year that we offered that. We offered 14 programs and we had 23, uh, 230 screens that participated. In April of 21, we offered 46 programs and we had over 1,500 screens that participated. Um, so patrons um, really are not showing any Zoom fatigue in participating in our programs remotely. In fact, we're seeing our participation steady or growing for our program. So that's been great. Um, so our biggest challenge as we go forward is a pivot in infrastructure related operations. And that's what my staff is working on right now as we look towards restoring our hours and all the um, services that we offer inside the building. So what our tech staff is working on, um, trying to reallocate all the equipment um, that has been allocated to staff um, that had been previously allocated to the public um, and making sure that we've got everything back in its original places uh, so that we can resume those services. Um, the same is true of our communications model as well. Uh, we are going to be resuming our print newsletter. Um, the first newsletter that we're going to offer, in fact, is going to be our summer newsletter. I can give you a quick preview of what that's going to look like here. Uh, that's going to launch um, our summer reading program. Um, so that'll be hitting mailboxes here um, in the next couple of weeks. In fact, I think that's off to the printer today. Um, and then our first um, 
regular programming and event newsletter um, is going to hit your mailboxes in the fall. We'll continue to rely on our email correspondence as the most immediate way for us to reach our patrons about our programming and events uh, throughout the course of the summer. We'll continue that as we move forward as well, um, but we will rely less upon that as much as, as we move into the, the print newsletters again. Um, we'll still be offering postcards for select events and we'll likely be using postcards to talk about the uh, closure that's coming up um, in August. Our website project is moving forward. Um, we've officially engaged with our kickoff team um, and we've got a lot of homework that we're already working on um, with our web redesign committee. Uh, that project, as I mentioned previously, is scheduled to launch in um, September and there will be opportunities for community engagement through focus groups as well as opportunities for the board to see that uh, draft website before um, it gets too far along in its development so you can provide feedback as we uh, move forward in that process. We're gonna work on updating our signage inside the building here soon um, as we start to pivot our operations. And um, obviously staffing remains another factor that we need to continue to study as we still are experiencing some retirements and a bit of turnover as people make life changes. So it's a very busy time at the library from an operations standpoint. Um, and um, I'm gonna pause there and uh, allow you all to ask any questions about anything either from my report or anything else that you've got a question about regarding library operations. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Trust Trustee Summer? Are you gonna continue the, the book, uh, the, maybe this isn't that new, between the League of Women Voters and the library? Is that gonna continue that book club? Oh, definitely. Yep, that's been a, that's been a great partnership um, and we're seeing tremendous participation. So yes, definitely. Other questions? Okay. Anything else? That's all I got. Okay. <laughs> Updates. Uh, Jan, do, Trustee Barshis, anything on ILA or Rails? No, there really wasn't anything this time. Okay. Director Austin, since you serve on one of the committees, anything that you'd like to add as to what's happening? Um, I'm actually officially off of the public policy committee now. My term has ended. Um, um, I've stepped up my participation on the CCS board, so I'm on their executive committee and their budget and finance committee. Um, nothing else to report there um, at this time. Um, if, if you've got questions about what our neighboring libraries are doing in terms of their um, bridge phase and their reopening plans. Um, there is documentation on the Rails site um, on their COVID Pulse page. Uh, there's a, um, a link there that you can click on that will show what all participating member libraries and Rails are doing regarding their plans. And you can kind of compare and contrast uh, what other folks are doing there. I went to, I attended the strategic planning workshop, which all of you can hit remotely. But what was really, what I really enjoyed about it is at, at, at midway through, after about 30 minutes, they broke us up into like size discussion groups with similar size libraries. And so one of the interesting things mm -hmm. is that everybody is going toward a probably about three year planning, no more than three years in terms of their strategic plan as opposed to five. And they put a lot of things on hold this past year due to COVID. Mm -hmm. and so. I will send you, I've got the PowerPoint uh, discussion of it. I'll send it out to you, but it was a good overview and it's good food for thought. And I'll bring it up in new business system. If someone would like to, I'll bring it up in new business. I'll be quiet. Okay. And uh, you've got communication, comments. Any comments, Director Austin? Um, I did. I did get a call um, from uh, one of our neighbors in the the building behind us, um, the the condos um, that share an alley with us. That um, is there anything we could do about that? Just incessant beeping with the tuck pointing uh, bucket truck going up and down all the time. And unfortunately, there we can't uh, defeat the sound on that system. It's it's there for OSHA purposes and to promote safety. It's annoying as heck. It's right outside of our offices too. Thankfully, that part of the project is now done, but I know that it was disruptive to our neighbors, and unfortunately, there wasn't anything we could do about it. 
Um, have had a couple of questions about trying to extend the time that's um, allocated in the computer room to use computers at this time. We're looking at trying to um, reallocate some space on the first floor to add back some more of the computers. We're trying to keep them at a safe distance for right now. Um, so we're hoping that we're gonna be able to allow folks to use computers for more than a single hour session um, here as we reintroduce these new computers in the next week or so. So, but that's, that's, the, that's the main comments that we've received to date. And always lots of folks asking about when is BDU coming back? When can we donate our materials again? Yeah. Uh, so um, I don't know, Marianne, do you want to comment on that? You can go ahead. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, so we've talked about this with the friends meetings. And um, our plan is to resume um, donation of materials here this summer. We'll make an announcement here soon. Um, the friends are gonna, we're gonna bring in our volunteers again here shortly to take an inventory of um, their collections, um, to get back into their rooms and uh, take a look at, the, at what they've got, um, prepare the, the spaces. And um, once we start accepting donations again, start sorting that material. We're also planning to host um, another pop-up book sale concurrent with uh, the Chamber's sidewalk sale um, the weekend of July 16, 17. Uh, this will be an outdoor book sale. The last time that we did that was, I believe, in the fall of 19. Um, so we're looking to do that again. Uh, they had a nice successful sale on the entry plaza, and we're going to do that same model. Uh, we don't have a program scheduled uh, concurrent with that on the lawn. We do have some story times coming up on the outside um, of the library this summer, um, but that will not conflict with the book sale. So we're excited to be able to offer that here soon. And our plan is to reopen BDU following Labor Day. Um, but that is the extent of the, the comments that I've received. Okay, thank you. You've got the information on the American Library Association annual conference. Traditionally, United for Libraries has a program for trustees, but as of yesterday, there was nothing on their website and nobody was answering the phone. So we will let you know when we know if they have it, if they plan on having it, because they didn't have it for the winter session of ALA. Okay. New business. I sent you all out committee assignments, and this was just a draft. And so we can fill in the blank for uh, finances. Tracy Summer policy would be me, Lisa McDonald. But ideally, I would like uh, every member to serve at least on one standing committee, as well as one special ad hoc committee. But that exclude that excludes uh, secretary's audit because. That tends to be the neophytes, and that's O'Keefe and Neyland takes about an hour. And you work just, to, and what you're doing is just certifying that all the minutes have been signed and the documents are there. And then uh, the Intergovernor, Intergovernmental Coordinating Committee, that's just when we used to host, there would be one event where they would invite all the government officials. And so two people from each of the uh, will met, uh, what do you say, park district, the school board and everything would show up, but there would never be more than two people because of the Open Meetings Act. So it couldn't be a public meeting. So when that comes up, I'll let you know. And then the other thing was nominating committee and that's a one-off. So we've got a new one, Community Connections Committee, and that's gonna be under Neil, Trish Nealon. And so I've got Trustee Barshis there, but if you if you just contact me or you can contact the chair if you wanna know more about what the plans are for it. But we're looking for some great communicators or some great political, anybody that has some good ideas. Also, we might, that might, that committee, and it's not decided yet because it's all up in the end, Anthony doesn't know it, might sort of, form the subcommittee to work with Anthony on how we might do the strategic planning process. But that will be open for discussion in terms of what that planning would be. And that's all I've got. And two committees are gone. One was replaced, uh, the advocacy committee was replaced with the community connections committee because mm -hmm. it also includes advocacy and buildings and equipment is gone because really, 
finance is basically who looks at the uh, budget and then internally you've got staff that handle that and all we do as a board is look at those contracts and make sure we've got the best one so that really was sort of out of our way so if you've got any thoughts or if there's anything you want to do or anything that you don't want to do just contact me and i think director austin will be sending from his office an updated list of the trustees with their contact information to you Yes, so and, um, and we also are preparing a, um, a trustee manual. Um, we do this on a regular basis for Kenilworth, and uh, Marty and I are adapting that document right now for our Wilmet board as well. So you will have something in print um, that will help you as trustees to um, have all of your, your bylaws certainly at your fingertips. Mm. But any other of our or, um, orientation documents and organizing uh, documents will all be at your fingertips in print. So we'll get that to you. It's a very large file. If we were to do it digitally, we'll find a way to get it in a digital format, but at least you'll have something in a print binder that you can reference. Um, uh, and, and just a reminder, don't forget about the parliamentary procedure workshop that Thank you. I and was just about you, to mention that. <laughs> and he'll send you another notice about it. But it was, a, I think both of us went in person. It was a wonderful overview. And it also is a good reminder of what library board members are supposed, or what their duties are and what their duties are not. And so I think it, it's a great clarification of those roles. Okay. So just a reminder, that's on June 5th. And um, you've got an email about that to register. It's, a, it's free and a courtesy of um, the Winnetka Northfield Public Library who have invited Wilmette, Kenilworth, and Glencoe to participate. Okay. Any other new business? Old business? Can we have a, I move that we adjourn the, this meeting at 8.17 PM. Is there a second? No. I'll second. I'll second. <laughs> Trustee Barshi seconded. <laughs> and do we need to do a roll call? Yeah, we do. Okay. Do a voice vote. Vote a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 We're all here, so unanimous. Have a good evening. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thank Anthony. Thank Thanks, Lisa. Time. Thank you. Top left corner.